and bad news, Father Adin often does it, and the kids yell out if they want to hear the good news or the bad news first. So in that vein, um, you know that uh, United States ambassadors need to be confirmed by the Senate if they're going to be the ambassador for the United States to serve in another country. However, if the Senate's not in session, Barack Obama, the president, whoever the active president is, can make what's called a recess appointment. And Barack Obama did make a recess appointment of the American ambassador to Turkey, and the guy's name is Ambassador Francis Richardon. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but Francis Richardon. And he's the one who's receiving American tax dollars to go and represent American interests to Turkey. In response to questions he received from a congressman, written questions he received from a congressman, ambassador, acting ambassador, I should say, Richard Gohm, wrote back, most of the Christian churches functioning on the territory of present-day Turkey prior to 1915 are still operating as churches. Most of the churches that were operating prior to 1915 are still operating. So we have to ask ourselves as Armenians, and a number of Armenian organizations are asking themselves, is he ignorant? Is he uneducated? Is he part of some kind of conspiracy? Well, we're not sure, but a lot of people are trying to educate him and make sure he gets on the side of truth and accuracy. Almost 100 years after the Armenian Genocide, all the work that we've done in Congress and all the work we've done to increase awareness of the Armenian Genocide, and the American ambassador to Turkey is making a statement such as this. It's sad. And now for more bad news. There is economic uncertainty. On Friday, August 5th, 2011, the United States based financial company Standard & Poor's downgraded the credit rating of the United States. We no longer have the highest credit rating there is. And this downgrade has made people nervous. They're worried. Where should we invest? What's the future of the economy going to be like? Is this going to plunge the, the uh, United States into depression? And a lot of the reason why this credit rating happened, this change in the credit rating happened, was because the, uh, of the debt ceiling, of how high the debt is. And the debt ceiling was raised yet again. Since 1962, the debt ceiling has been raised 74 times. And in the last 10 years, the debt ceiling has been raised 10 times. So sometimes political parties like to point at each other and say it's your fault, it's, no, it's your fault. But the reality is that the political parties that have been serving in Congress are both responsible for raising the debt ceiling over and over and over again. So much so that according to the United States official accounting, the current United States debt is $14 trillion, which comes out to about $45,000 per person. Of course, that number is disputed. A lot of people say that the only way that that number could be arrived at is by very creative accounting. Because Congress has passed certain laws that they're going to fund certain things, and they haven't figured in the, the future deficit that they anticipate from the things that they've promised to fund. Richard Fisher is the president of the Dallas Federal Reserve. And recently, in a statement, he said that the actual um, amount that America owes is closer to a hundred trillion dollars. This is his quote. Let's say every U.S. citizen who is alive today decided to fully address this unfunded liability through lump sum payments from our own pocketbooks so that all of us and all future generations could be secure in the knowledge that we and they would receive promised benefits in perpetuity. How much would we have to pay if we split the tab? Again, the math is painful. With a total population of 304 million, from infants to the elderly, the per-person payment to the federal treasury would come to $330,000. This comes to $1.3 million per family of four. That's how great the national debt has risen to. The world is full of greed and injustice, and anyone with clear eyes can see this. And Jesus even said, those who love their life will lose it, but those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. That is to say that there's something healthy in seeing that there's very bad things going on in this world, that evil abounds, it's all around us. The presence of evil, sin, and suffering is not a new thing. It is as present today as it was in biblical times. It is as present today as it was as the time of Mary. In the book of Ecclesiastes, 
as the author writes, there is nothing new under the sun. So troubled times are nothing new. But there is good news. We can rise above the sufferings of this world while recognizing that there is evil in the world and evil within ourselves. We needn't be thrown into depression. We needn't feel forsaken or forlorn. We can rejoice with knowledge of who God is and what God has done for us. And if we keep mindful of the great things that God has done, the joy that we have in Christ will trump the sad and troubled things of this world. And as Christians, we have a call and responsibility to keep a mindfulness of God so that we might share this joy with others, not only so that we might have joy, but so that we might share this joy with others. St. Mary, whose feast day we are celebrating today, the greatest of her feast days, the Assumption of the Virgin Mary into Heaven, was somebody who rejoiced in the Lord and her soul magnified God. So when people looked at her, they saw God more clearly. And that was largely due to the joy that she had, that she lived a, a joyful life, rejoicing in what God had done for her. And so she set us an example. Do we live joyful lives so that when people look at us, they see there's something different about that person. They have a joy in the Lord that I'd like to have. When Mary was told by the angel that she, she was going to give birth to Jesus, she responded, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy extends to all those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful for Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary was joyful because she was mindful of what God had done in the past for her nation, what God had done in the world what God had done in her life. And this mindfulness of God produced a joy. It produced a joy that magnified for others the presence of God. And in that, she set us a fantastic example. This prayer, this prayer that I just read, the words of Mary, are called the Magnificat. And the fact that she spoke these so smoothly and so freely means that they were just part of her, and these words poured forth from her soul. A thankful heart should be a joyous heart, and we as Christians have so much to be thankful about. There was a guy who repaired washing machines. He was married, he had six children, and his wife was staying home and taking care of the kids, and money was very tight. And it was difficult, especially at this particular time, because school was starting and all the kids needed shoes, and funds were so incredibly tight. So he went on one of his jobs that morning to a very large, beautiful home, a rich home, and he had to fix a beautiful washing machine as well. But the whole morning he had been troubled, and he was even crying in the, in the truck on the way over, thinking that no matter how hard I work or how many extra hours I work, I could never seem to make ends meet like I'd like them to make, make them meet. So he arrives at the house, and he walks in the door, and the, the lady of the house can sleep, he's very troubled, and she says, what's wrong, what's, what's going on? And he says, I don't want to bother you, I just want to fix your washing machine. She says, no, no, what's, what's going on? And so he said, you know, my, my kids are starting school, and I have to buy six pairs of shoes, and it's so, it's so difficult. And with that, she started crying. And he thought that she was crying because of the compassion that she felt for him. But in reality, her own son was a paraplegic. And she shared that. She said, I wish I had the need to buy my child. So often we can think of what we don't have. We can think of how we wish the world were different. We can think of how we wish our lives were different. And we can become very troubled. But Mary set for us an example to rejoice in the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord. Later on, we're going to do the blessing of grapes. And even though the blessing of grapes service doesn't have a direct connection to the Feast of Assumption, it just so happens that people would bless the grapes. This is around the harvest time for the grapes. The grapes would be blessed at this time. There is
is a, a connection, in a sense, because the idea in the Bible is that the first fruits would be offered to the Lord. We don't give God the leftovers. The covenant community of Israel would give the first and the best if they were to be right with God. With the knowledge that by doing that, they're demonstrating that God is the source of all good things. So if we recognize that God is indeed the source of good things, we will offer him our first and our best. That applies to finances, but it doesn't only apply to finances. It also applies to how we begin our day. And I have to confess, I'm guilty of this as well. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, I lay in bed, and I think about how miserable this or that is in the world, and I think of my to-do list, and try to think of everything that has to go through in the day. And sometimes, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is not what I should do, which is to thank God, to thank God for another day. We as Christians are to be people whose hearts are full of thanksgiving. So when we talk about offering the first to God, the first thing that we need to offer to God is the first minutes of our day. When you arise in the morning, it's a beautiful opportunity to praise the Lord, to think of the good things that he has done for you, for your nation, the Armenian nation, for America, the things that he did for Israel, and what you have received through that. Think of the resurrection. Think of the promise of eternal life. And also think of what we receive today, the feast we're celebrating today. And the reason is that in the Bible, Jesus raised people from the dead, but the people he raised from the dead went on to live more suffering in this life, in this world. But Mary's the exception, because when he raised her from the dead, she didn't stay on the earth to endure more suffering. He brought her to heaven. And in her being raised from the dead and brought to heaven, so too we recognize that Jesus has the power to fulfill the promise that he gave us. And soon, one day, he will return, and he will take us to be with himself. Let this joy, let the knowledge of what God has done and is doing, fill our mornings from the first minutes of our day. Let us contemplate the goodness of God as we arise in the morning, offering him the first part of the day. So throughout the day, we might be filled with joy, and that joy might magnify the Lord.